How's it going? This is Mr. Samingo. Hello, Academic Decathlon team. Um, as I told you, you're going to be watching a, a series of videos uh, regarding Academic Decathlon. Think of it as my lectures because we don't have class all the time. Um, it's going to be a lot of information. Also, these videos are very long, so make sure that you take some breaks, pause it, don't watch all these videos at the same time. Um, be sure to take notes. I gave you all um, blank packets that you could uh, fill in the blanks. This is to help you monitor your progress, take notes. Um, the only notes, or sorry, the notes that you take, it doesn't have to be just the blanks. You could write more notes. You could also pause me to take notes. So that's the great thing about these lectures. Also, though, that we'll watch these later on again so to get you ready for your um, actual decathlon. So the goal is not to memorize everything and know everything I'm going to teach. It's very complicated, um, but to retain as much information as you can. So let's start with traditional energy generation. This is section one. In your packets, I wrote a little percentage. And what that percentage means is that on the actual decathlon day of the test, that's how many questions will be based out of that section. So section one is 10%. Each section is 50 questions, so doing the basic math, you have um, five questions from this section on um, from the decathlon. So again, um, starting from the beginning, again, this is the basics of energy. So first of all, um, energy can change into different forms. The forms could be sound, heat, light, kinetic, magnetic, electric, chemical. And even though its form might change, the energy of a system that does not interact in any way with anything will remain constant. So long story short, if you have a closed system, the energy can change forms, but the energy will always remain constant. So the principles of energy, so you can think of energy drinks. Oh, by the way, these PowerPoints are from a service called uh, Demideck. They like to use alpacas and really corny, sarcastic jokes. So if it's not funny, uh, I'm sorry. So first of all, these principles of energy, there's three basic principles. They're called axioms. Um, the first principle is that all matter and all things have energy. So whether it's molecules, waves, living cells, they all have energy. The second thing is that the energy within a system is the sum of all the energies inside of it. So it's very simple. So basically, if you have a system, like I said, all the energies, if you add them all up, they equal the energy of the system. And lastly, as I mentioned in the last slide, energy is conserved. So that, again, if energy does not interact with anything else, um, the energy is constant. So the universe always contains the same amount of energy. You can't add, you can't create or destroy energy. Um, so principles in action. So first of all, when it says energy is conserved. So the energy input during a given period accounts for all energy outflow and increase in system energy. So in a full, uh, a fuel, so when we're talking about in action, think for example of a typical power plant or a fossil fuel burning power plant. So the energy input during a given period accounts for all the energy outflow. So and all the energy that I put into this power plant, I'm going to get it out somehow. Some of it is usable and some of it is not. Now when we say the system energy is a sum of partial energies, again, taking the example of a power plant, um, the system energy of a power plant is the same at all points in time during steady operation. So basically, during a typical day of this power, planting, uh, this power plant operating, um, the system energy is always the same. So within this power plant, whether it's, you know, it's, it's taking the coal and burning the coal and, and, and processing the coal, the, the entire system inside this power plant, the energy is always the same, and it's always one, the whole system's energy, basically. And then matter has energy, so energy is stored in system mass and flow of fuel, air, water, so all these things have energy. So when we talk about keeping the energy books, um, this is a way that we... Uh, it's an equation to calculate the amount of energy that is stored and it's changed. So first of all, this little triangle, you should know that means delta. So the change in energy stored, so it says here the change in energy stored within the system, is equal to the energy that you put in minus the energy that you take out plus the energy that you've generated. So um, the total amount of energy that's entering the system plus the total amount of energy leaving during the time period or, or energy. So it should be all balanced. Remember, energy cannot be created or destroyed. It's always the same. So it should be always equal to zero. Um, but then we can convert it. So this one says 30%. Um, we're talking about this is the typical fuel energy that is converted to electrical energy in a typical power plant. So, um, <coughs> sorry. So that fuel energy that, say, for example, coal um, is the example that we're using. It comes in as coal. We, we, we process it. We use it. 
and then what is usable or what we use for electricity in our lights in our um, to operate our ho our homes um, thirty percent of that is converted into electricity um, we're going to talk about also units of energy that you need to know so energy is measured in different types of units depending on um, what you're looking at what you're using um, calories you may have me familiar with calories because you eat it. People count calories. There's apps on the phone to count how much you're eating. And people always equate calories to like fat or how fat you're going to be or whatever. A calorie is literally the energy needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So you are eating energy. So when you eat food, it is energy. Um, when you talk about the food calorie, it's actually equal to a kilocalorie, but they just call it a calorie, so I know it's kind of confusing. Um, but one unit of energy is called a calorie, which is the energy needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. The other energy unit you may need to know is BTU. It stands for British Thermal Unit. It's the energy to raise the temperature of one pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. And then a joule is the energy needed to power a one watt light bulb for one second. So Depending on what you're talking about, depending on whose, um, um, you know, whose work you're looking at or, or what calculations you're doing, um, these are the three major energy units that you're going to be um, that you're going to be uh, that you're going to be using it that you need to know. Uh, another energy unit or something that you know is called power. I'm sure everyone's familiar with what power is, but power is a a unit that is calculated using energy. So here's the equation you need to know about power. Power is equal to the change of energy or the amount of energy used divided by the amount of time required for energy transfer. So if I basically the amount of energy that is user supplied and you divide that by time, you get power. Uh, another way to look at it, here's another equation for you. The energy consumed is equal to the power times time. So all these are kind of related. Um, this equation is just you know T multiplied to both sides of the equation. But basically that's how energy and power are related. So power times time gives me energy. Um, that's what power is. Power also has its own units. The ones that you should be very familiar with are watts and kilowatts. If you get light bulbs or check out light bulbs, um, there's a watt. A watt is joules per second. And this was named after Scottish engineer James Watt. A kilowatt is basically 1,000 watts. This is the common unit of power for appliances. So in your microwaves or, or some of your other appliances, you'll see kilowatts as the major uh, as the most common unit that you'll see. And then the one to see for cars is called horsepower. Horsepower is about uh, three-fourths kilowatts. It's a common unit of power for motors and pumps. Again, this, this is an equivalent for, um, or not equivalent, but it's a unit of energy, or a unit of power, sorry. Now, how do you generate power? How do you generate energy? Things like that. Um, how do these power plants work? So the, the basics are um, spinning a turbine. A turbine is generally how energy is created. So when you rotate something, it basically converts potential energy into kinetic energy. So one big example is, let's say for example, um, hydroelectric power. What happens is that water falls on these paddles. Okay, The paddles then spin the wheel. The wheel turns a shaft, Okay, and that shaft provides energy for grindstone, other tools, so the modern water wheel is based on the exact same um, the exact same principles as I've done like way back in the old ages. Um, a simple water wheel can convert 10 to 20 percent of the water's potential energy into mechanical work. Um, additional potential energy can be used depending on what the blades are like. So if the paddles are more like buckets, then you could generate more energy. So this is what they call a simple water wheel. Um, but there's different kinds of turbines now. And again, a turbine is the basics, the basic of how energy is generated. So this impulse turbine, which you see here, this uses a nozzle to accelerate the fluid stream, the water that goes through or whatever fluid is passing through. And it has bucket-like um, paddles, which we just talked about. And that pressures, um, that pressures the forces to turn the wheel. Um, one type of impulse turbine is called the Pelton wheel. And it's a type of impulse turbine that maximizes, it's like the most efficient turbine, and it has an 80% efficiency. The reaction turbine, which you see here, I know it looks kind of weird, um, it operates while completely filled with fluid and water. So it's filled with fluid or it's filled with water. Um, 
and it, it's based on a rotor instead of buckets like this impulse turbine. The area for flow kind of decreases so that there's no there's not that much flow going on, but the fluid is accelerated with the blades and the, and the passages within the blades, um, and that pressure exerts fluid onto the blades, which push the rotor around. There's a steam turbine, which is right here. It operates in a similar way. High pressure steam is fed to the nozzles, and then it's accelerated and released, and then the turbine blades attached to a rotor move it. Okay, so it's like steam is moving these, these turbines. Okay. Large steam turbines, the largest one, um, it's, its efficiency is up to 85%. Um, gas turbines, which you see up here in the, on top left, they use air or helium, and they also spin these turbines, but they use a gas instead. Um, they're well suited for generating large amounts of kilowatts. So if I want the most kilowatts, I'm going to use a gas turbine. A typical automotive gas turbine uh, has an efficiency of about 80% as well. And then there's also hydraulic and hydroelectric. So these are both water-based that we talked about in the last slide. So we're going to close this video. Well, actually, we have two slides, but I want you to watch the video about that Pelton turbine that I just talked about. The old water wheel is the precursor to modern Pelton turbines. Wood water wheels have been used to extract power from flowing water and convert it into mechanical power since the third century. Often, water wheels provided power for water mills, which used millstones for grinding wheat to produce flour. The rotational movement of the water wheel spun the runner stone of the mill by means of a gear unit. The opening in the middle of the runner stone is called eye where the grains were filled in two. As the runner stone turned, the grains were being cut and crushed by the stones that turned the grains into flour. The water wheel has long been replaced by the Pelton turbine for several reasons. Because of their clever design, Pelton wheels are far more efficient than water wheels of the past. The rotational movement of the turbine is usually transmitted to a generator, converting kinetic energy into electrical energy. A series of spoon-shaped buckets is mounted around the edge of the Pelton wheel. Buckets are usually cast as one solid piece, which is necessary to avoid damage, such as fatigue failure. The buckets have splitters placed at the middle of them that divide the water jets into two equal streams. The divider splits the flow of water striking it and changes the direction of the water by almost 180 degrees. This allows the wheel to capture almost 100% of the water's energy. So that's a, a short video about the Pelton turbine. I hope you guys understand more how they work, how you can convert potential energy into kinetic energy or, any, or mechanical energy. So the last thing about this, uh, this video, we're going to talk about a centrifugal pump and a centrifugal compressor and let you know the difference. A pump, um, they, they, both of them work according to very similar principles. So the pump increases the liquid flow, the energy of the liquid flow, by converting the liquid's kinetic energy into flow energy. And it produces a high discharge pressure at the pump outlet. So what happens is that the rotating blades, they increase the energy of liquid flow. Okay. A diffuser, it decelerates the liquid flow, so it, it kind of slows down the liquid flow. And what it does, it creates pressure at the pump outlet. And this is something that they use to circulate coolant in automobile, energy, uh, automobile engines. So again, this depends a lot on the blade design, how the blade looks like. The highest discharge pressure for pumps, again, they occur at the pump outlet. And when the flow is really high, this pump gets really ineffective. Okay, The compressor... Also known as a, um, it's also known as a radial flow compressor. It's similar to the centrifugal pump again, but it's more often to increase the pressure in gases. So again, the rotating blades instead of trans they transfer kinetic energy to gas flow. The pump is liquid flow. This one's more gas flow. The diffuser this time it decelerates the gas flow to inc in increase gas pressure, and then this is used for supercharging piston engines. So you can see how they're very similar. The pump is more for fluid and it creates pressure. Um, to do it that way, whereas a compressor, it does it for gas, which is increases the pressure. Um, and that's how a centrifugal compressor works. So that's it for section one. I hope that through the reading and through this video, it makes you understand a little better about what, um, what that section is all about. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you all later.